So hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for logging on and attending today's program. My name is Matt Schumann. I work at the library on the programming team. Before we begin, please let me know if there are any technical issues that I can try to resolve. Um, we will be recording today's event, uh, but it will just be on the active speaker, which will just be Chef Trisha. Um, questions can be asked at the end by unmuting yourself, or um, you can use the chat function and I'll read those uh, out loud. Uh, this program is also made possible by the generous donors to Cary Library. Uh, with us today is Chef Trisha Perez Keneally, who will be teaching us through who will be teaching us about Puerto Rican cooking through a few dishes today. Trisha is the owner of the Inn at Hastings Park. Uh, she will also be back on June 2nd at 10 a.m. for a program about basic knife skills. And now I will give the floor over to Chef Trisha. Good morning, everyone. It's so nice to have everyone with us. I'm pretty pleased and touched that so many people signed up for today's lesson. Um, for those of you who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting or welcoming to the Inn, um, as Matt said, my name is Trisha Perez Keneally. Um, I grew up in Puerto Rico and moved to Lexington when I was 12. Um, my father's family is from the island. My dad grew up in New York City, which is where he met my mom. Um, and early in the 70s, early 70s, my dad and my mother moved back to Puerto Rico. Um, for a job opportunity for my father. And what was supposed to be a two year stint turned into more like a decade. So I had the privilege of going to elementary school in Puerto Rico. Um, more importantly, I had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with my paternal grandparents who lived in the Southern side of the island, um, as well as my dad's sister and brothers um, and his large extended family. I love Puerto Rico. It's one of my favorite places to be in the world. Um, They've been, if we think we have it bad right now, you can only imagine what it must be like for the people, especially of the Southern coast, the Southern Western coast, where my family is from. Just as they were getting back on their feet from Hurricane Maria, they had a series of over 2000 earthquakes um, that started around December 28th of this year. The kids in those communities had just gone back to school when the governor had to close down the island, very similar to what we've been doing here. So for some of the kids in Puerto Rico, they haven't really had the opportunity to go to school since early January. Before this all started, I had actually been in conversations with one of my favorite chefs in the world. His name is Wilo Bennett. If you have an opportunity to look at any of his cookbooks, I would highly encourage you to. Um, and hopefully Wilo, Chef Wilo Bennett is gonna be coming and joining us at the Inn in the fall so that we can do a fundraiser for Puerto Rico because they're still recovering from the hurricane, as I said, the earthquake has made the earthquakes in the southern part have made things more difficult. And now with the lack of tourism business, it's really not an easy go. So here's my tribute to my family and friends in Puerto Rico who provide me so much joy. Um, and as I said, it's one of my favorite places in the world to be. And I can't wait to get back there with my family to be able to enjoy some of these dishes that my family and friends have taught me to make down there. So today we are going to do, um, we're going to make an arroz con pollo, which is a very traditional rice and chicken. I think every family has their own variation. Um, I'm going to be making two different types of turnovers. One is an empanadilla, a meat stuffed um, turnover. And the other one is sort of a tribute to the Spanish influence on the island. It's a manchego, which is a Spanish cheese. And manchego and guava in Spain, yeah. they would eat I think that someone needs to mute um, to mute themselves. So the other one is manchego, which is a Spanish cheese. And in Spain, they usually serve it with quince paste. In Puerto Rico, we eat a lot of guava um, because the guavas are indigenous to the island. So that's the second one. And then I'm also going to make a really simple cookie that um, many children in Puerto Rico grow up eating. It's called the mantecadito, which can either translate to tasty cookie or, you know, little small ice cream. Yes. There's a question. Sure, Roy. Can you give a website so we can make a donation to help your community in Puerto Rico? Um, yes, I would be more than happy to. I have actually been incredibly touched by a group of citizens here in Lexington. 
um, out of Hancock Church who started a group called Lexington Unites for Puerto Rico. If you go to the Hancock Church website, you can make a donation there. And what I like about that donation is that donation is going directly through three to three villages and it's buying things like fishing nets, fishing boats, solar powered refrigerators, things that we know that the communities absolutely need. The other place that you can donate, um, if you're familiar with Jose, with Chef Jose Andres, um, he's Spanish, but he's based in Washington, D.C. Um, his World Kitchen fed millions of people, made millions of meals in Puerto Rico, and I do mean millions. And he wrote a fabulous book about his experience cooking in Puerto Rico in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. And of course, as soon as the earthquake started, he was right back on the ground in Puerto Rico, making sure that people were fed. And what's interesting about that story is that he, when he goes into communities, he really tries to cook um, the things that are culturally significant, that really make a difference. And he was using a lot of recipes, like we have a stew called sancocho, which is like a vegetable and a meat stew. He was using a lot of our own traditional recipes in Puerto Rico because those recipes were really designed to really take care of people and feed them well. So he was really using a lot of our own heritage in taking care of the people in Puerto Rico. So I'm gonna move over to the stove right now. Um, I'm gonna move over to the stove right now. I'm actually gonna heat up a little bit of olive oil. I'm sorry, canola oil. And I'm gonna keep that heating up on the back. I'm heating up that olive oil. Sorry, I keep saying olive oil. I am heating up canola oil because we are going to use this canola oil to cook off our meat pies or empanadillas. What I'm going to do first is I actually am going to make, um, get us started with our arroz con pollo. Um, I got up early this morning because um, for those of you who had joined us a few weeks ago, the chicken stock that I had made a few weeks ago, I'd already gone through that. So I got up this morning and I made some chicken stock and I wanted people to sort of take a look at this. So I used a small chicken, I used a four pound chicken, and then I added some celery, some onions, some carrot. I made my stock, drained it off. But I, what I wanted to show people is that I had gone through when that chicken was about 40 minutes, after it cooked about 40 minutes in the boiling water, I took out the chicken, I let it cool for about 15 minutes while the stock was continuing to boil. And what I did is I stripped the meat off the bones and then I threw the bones back in the stock and then I was able to drain that and now I have this beautiful chicken stock that I'm going to use in our recipe. So um, what I've done this morning is I've also done some cutting and chopping to get us ready. Um, the French talk about their mirepoix which is sort of their base of vegetables which consists of carrot, onion, and celery. Sometimes they also add leek to it. Every culinary tradition has sort of their base of vegetable herbs and spices. And in Puerto Rico, it's a lot of pepper, onion, garlic, um, cilantro. We also have sort of a broader leaf type of cilantro that grows that we use a lot in Puerto Rico, but it's not so easy to find here. Um, I also wanted to show you the pepper that I'm using. This is a cubanelle pepper. So it's the longer peppers, they come in red, they come in green. You can buy them at Market Basket, they have them at Wilson Farm. So what you're looking for is that more elongated pepper. If you can't find that, it's totally fine to use a red pepper, yellow pepper, orange pepper. I like to add a little bit of color, so that's why I tend to use some of those other colors. So what I've done is I finally, well this is more of a coarse chop. I chopped the cubanelle pepper, the onion. Um, I've kept the garlic separate because I don't want that, um, I don't want that to get fried or burnt while I'm doing it. So now what I'm going to do is I am going to take my chicken thighs. Today I'm using boneless chicken thighs, but I just as easily would use um, a bone in thigh with skin on. But in terms of, because of the length of time that we have for the demonstration, I sort of went with this. I am a big fan of the chicken thigh. I think it's the most favorite, one of the most flavorful cuts of chicken, of the whole chicken, if you're going to be cooking with pieces. You could also take a whole chicken and cut it into eight pieces, the very traditional French way of doing that, and use those pieces to make your arroz con pollo. 
So the first step in our host con pollo is, I'm actually gonna steal a little bit of my canola oil here. You could also use olive oil, but it was there and it was handy, so I'm just gonna go ahead and use that. I'm gonna season these chicken thighs with adobo. Adobo, um, there's most people, let's see, most people in Puerto Rico use adobo, the Goya product. Goya is prolific in Puerto Rico and now you can get just about any Goya product here in the United States as well. Um, it's a mixture of onion, salt, pepper. Some, this one has pepper, some of it um, doesn't have pepper. And my producer Rory and my cinematographer Rory, also known as my youngest son, is saying that he thinks that the red top is the best one because um, there's different color tops um, depending on the combination of spices. So I have my, the heat on a medium flame. That's a good sizzle. Um, as you can see, I've taken the chicken thighs and I've drained them on a paper towel. Take away a little bit of that moisture. What I'm doing here is I'm browning. My intent is not to cook the chicken all the way through because that will continue as, um, as we go. While those are cooking for a few minutes, I'm going to take you over to my next workstation after I wash my hands from the chicken. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the meat pies. So what I have here in terms of the meat pies is I have two different types of, um, of shells. The orange ones were covered, were colored with something called anato. Um, we use the anato a lot to sort of color the oils that we use or color the doughs that we use. The white one is more of a, puff, it's not puff pastry, it's more like a, a pie shell. And I'm going to use this one for the sweeter meat pie that I'm going to do. So this morning, another thing that I did was I cooked off our meat, the filling for our meat pies. And the filling for our meat pies, which I included the recipe, is a combination, it's a meatloaf blend. So a meatloaf blend is a combination of um, veal, pork, and beef. If you don't eat pork for religious reasons, if you don't eat meat because you object to the way that it's raised, you could, you know, you could use just about any ground meat. So once again, I'm using one of my favorite kitchen tools, which is the ice cream scoop, because I love the way it provides equal portions to the things that I'm doing. So basically I'm going through, and if you notice, I'm putting the meat on the lower part of the shell because I'm going to then fold it over and seal it. Um, this recipe brings back incredible childhood memories, not only for me, but it seems like it is uh, a lot of memories for my children as well. Um, they were part of the meal that my daughter asked for the night before she left for college. We usually make these for my son's birthdays. Um, and oftentimes we are out west skiing with a big group of friends when my sons have their birthdays. So I have flown across, I actually flew across the country this February with meat pies already made and frozen. And I put them in my suitcase and I carried them with me um, out to uh, Utah to make. I'm gonna go back over to my chicken because I can see that there's beginning to be some color. Um, there's the whiteness, not color, but rather the whiteness around the side. It's coming right off the pan so that I know that it's ready to turn. One of the biggest mistakes people make when they're cooking is they don't let their pan get hot enough. If your meat is sticking, it means that your pan is not hot enough and the meat, the protein, hasn't come to the temperature that it needs to be at for you to turn it over. Those turn over nice and easily. So I have a baking pan right here waiting for them, and I'm going to take those out. Really what I'm looking for is that nice golden color that I got there, because the chicken is going to continue to cook. Um, with the chicken stock and the tomato sauce when we finish that off. 
So now I'm going to finish these last other pieces. I didn't need to add any more oil. If I was using a bone in chicken thigh, I probably wouldn't use any oil at all. I might, might just coat the, um, the bottom of the pan with a, take a silicon basting brush and coat the bottom of the pan with olive oil because the fat from the skin and the fat of the chicken thigh is more than enough to provide um, sort of the heating material that you would need to brown those chicken thighs. All right, so I'm going to leave those for a second. While those are going, I'm going to come over to my second batch of the our turnovers, our meat pies. And what I have here is pasta de guayaba. This is a paste that's made from the guava fruit. And as children, a very popular snack is having salty crackers with a little bit of the guava, the guava paste. The guava paste is extremely sweet. I mean, this is, you know, it's basically you're taking the fruit of the guava and you're mixing it um, with a little bit of sugar, right? So this is sold. Um, they have it, as I said, they have it in market basket and they have it in a box. This is the one that came in the box and they have it in a tin. Um, the tin brings back special memories because that was sort of the way that, you know, we, we bought it when I was little. So this is what it looks like. It kind of feels like a very thick fruit tape or fruit leather, fruit roll-ups. It has a very nice um, sort of tangy sweetness to it that goes very nicely with, it contrasts really nicely with the Manchego cheese. Um, in Puerto Rico and throughout Latin America, we also eat a lot of Cipo Blanco. It's like a white farmer's cheese. It's not as salty as a feta cheese, and it's actually made with cow's milk, not goat's milk. Um, but it has like that nice sort of briny saltiness that, again, is also um, a good flavor with this. I can tell by the sort of change in the sound that the chicken was ready to turn. And I know that that sort of sounds a little bit funny, but after a long time of being in the kitchen, you use all of your senses. I was always very impressed with my, my instructors that were part of this. They sort of seem to have an innate sense of when things were ready based on the way it looked, the way it smelled, the sounds that they could hear. And you begin to realize that if you cook more and more, you, you tend to develop that, those, those abilities. All right, so we have some nice caramelization on the bottom of the pan. And what I'm going to do is I am going to add our vegetables. So also in Puerto Rico, like if I wanted to, I also could have used something called sofrito. Um, and the sofrito is basically these vegetables, but it also has the tomatoes and the cilantro. And a lot of families will get together and make a big batch and sort of put it in mason jars or freeze it in ice cube trays so they can have it to use. Again, Goya has a sofrito product that they sell. You can find it in the supermarket. Um, and it just has a really nice, um, you know, that, that flavor of the, the peppers, the onion, the garlic. I, I am going to add the garlic, but I'm going to wait. Um, I'm going to let this go for about four or five minutes while I come back over to our meat pies. So I've cut the, the, the guava paste, and I'm going to go now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to line up. I had, a piece, uh, I had a piece of manchego cheese. It was less than half a pound. And what I did was I cut, I cut it into slices, and I'm taking two pieces of manchego and then I'm going to put a piece of I'm going to put a half a piece of guava over it because of the high sugar content in the guava it it's going to melt right so you want to sort of make sure that you don't put too much or else you are going to have all of the guava escape over And Israel jelly wants to look. 
Yeah, what, so one of the things that um, Roy was talking about, I've done these different ways. Um, there's also guava jelly um, that you know people use on toast and whatnot. And I tried it with it once and um, I actually think I fried them that time. I actually sort of have been playing with this recipe. And what I like to do now is I use these, these white ones, these white shells. And these shells can be found in the frozen section of the supermarket. Um, Goya has its own sort of frozen food area in the market basket stores um, in this area. And you can get, um, you can get these, um, the, they're called plantillas or turnover shells. Um, you also can get, we make tostones using the white plantain. A tostone is a fried plantain. It's the green plantain. If the plantain has turned yellow, it is not a banana, it is still a plantain, but we use those, they have a sweetness to them and we do something, we make something called amarillos, um, which is softer and sweeter than the, the toston. The toston, the fried plantain, similar to what you would do with the French fry, a real French fry is fried twice at two different temperatures. The first one sort of ensures that the potato is cooked the second one gives you that crispiness. And same thing with the tostón. When we make a fried plantain, we will cut the plantain into cylinders. We'll flat fry those cylinders first. And then when they come out, we use a tostonera, which is basically two pieces of wood. And you wanna, you smash the, um, the plantain down um, and then you fry it again. And oftentimes in between the fry, when you, uh, when you squeeze it and you've made that disc, we dip it in garlic water and then we put it back in to fry. So just another example of some of the products that you can find there. You also can find yuca, which is cassava, which is one of my favorite things in the world. Um, and you can either, you could fry it like a french fry, but you also can make a really delicious, when you boil the yuca, you can drain it. You sort of want to boil it so it's just al dente, not overly salt not overly soft and then you can mix it with all um, red onions and a little bit of garlic and olive oil and if you cook off the red onions and make them a little bit softer and have them sort of stewing in that olive oil it's a really great flavor and it's a really nice accompaniment to fish or chicken it's really a great dish so now that i've gone through i have filled all of my plantain my uh, plantilla shells and what i'm going to do is I have a ramekin full of water and I'm going to use my finger as sort of a paintbrush and I have my handy dandy fork to seal and I'm going to go through and I am going to seal up the plantains. So basically I take them, I fold them over, I have the water, I seal them, and usually what we do is we have a little bit of an assembly line to do these. When I was a child and we would go to visit my grandparents, my grandmother and grandfather had a really nice, totally modern, complete modern kitchen inside of their house. But my grandmother preferred to cook in what we would call a fogon, like an outside kitchen in her backyard. So she had all of these beautiful appliances inside and then in the backyard under a covered roof, I guess she was ahead of her time with the concept of an outdoor kitchen. Um, she had this, she had a refrigerator out there, but then she also had this fantastic gas, it was probably propane to be honest, propane, uh, propane fueled uh, stove. And she would, her and my grandfather would just churn out food my dad is the oldest of four children, and um, there are six grandchildren, and then their extended family. You know, we I grew up with all of my dad's first cousins and their children, so it would it wouldn't be uncommon for them to be thirty or forty people hanging out at my grandparents' house. The men would be playing dominoes in you know in part of the house, and I can still hear the sound the ivory of the dominoes makes a very distinctive sound when you move it around the table and i can still hear that sound so what rory's doing for me right now is he is sealing up the 
the turnover. And what we do is we basically, we just use a fork and we go around the edge to crimp to make sure that it's done. So he's gonna keep going with that. And what I am going to do over here is I forgot to put the canola oil. Um, I'm over by the stove, sorry that you can't see that. We'll be back on in a second. Um, I'm heating up the canola oil on a medium, medium high heat. And what I wanna do is I wanna show you the level of the canola oil. Um, it is very important when you're deep frying that you use a lot of oil. I think in the United States, we are sometimes so afraid of the fat content of things that we think that we're doing ourselves, like we're making a healthier meal by doing something that should have been deep frying and using half the amount of oil. That is actually wrong. What happens is, um, if there isn't enough oil, whatever you're frying is going to soak up the oil that it needs to get hot and cook, and it's going to be much more oily and fatty than it needs to be. If you use the proper amount of oil, the object that you're frying will go in, it will be encased in the oil, it will be sealed, and it will be fried off, and it will be a lot like less greasy than if you tried to skimp and not use the right amount of oil. So um, I shredded off these vegetables. Um, they're a nice, softer texture. Where can you bring the camera over here so we can show everyone? Yeah. Did you see the vegetables? Oh, you could. Oh, sorry about that. You could tell me that. So I've added the garlic. And what I did is I didn't want to add the garlic um, too soon because I didn't want it to burn. The other thing that you can, you want to check that camera angle? The other thing that you can see is that I have the, all of the caramelization from the chicken that was in the bottom of the pan. I've now, the liquid that was released from the vegetables has helped me um, scrape that off the bottom of the pan. And that's fantastic flavor. You don't want to lose that. Okay, so now the next thing that I'm going to do is I am going to add rice. And Puerto Ricans have rice. If it, we were left to our own devices, we might have rice with every meal of the day. Uh, rice with fried eggs over it in the morning, um, lunch. When I was growing up, even when I went to school in Puerto Rico, the hot lunch in Puerto Rico was a full meal. It was a very big deal at, at school for lunch. So it wasn't uncommon for us to go to lunch and have roasted chicken, have a beef stew, have a really, arroz con pollo, have a very substantive meal as that middle meal. So traditionally when we make rice in Puerto Rico, it's long grain rice and the proportions that most home cooks use in Puerto Rico are two parts rice to two parts water. So if I had two cups of rice, I would be using two cups of water. That's to make the white rice. To make arroz con pollo, what I'm gonna do today, I've used two cups and it's made this idea a little bit different than the recipe that you have. Um, reason being that I'm making enough here for us to have today. Um, and I also have been cooking for some friends who had a baby and some friends who are on the front line as doctors while we go through um, the pandemic. So I've been cooking for them as well. So I was making a little bit extra. The key is I'm not doing equal proportions here. I am doing, um, I'm doing a cup more. So I'm going to add some tomato sauce. Um, I tend to use, I think it's kind of old habit. I usually use a product that's in a box, but I think there's something about the Goya tomato sauce that makes me think of my childhood. So that's what I tend to use when I'm doing this recipe. The chicken stock that I made before, I'm going to measure out two cups into my Pyrex measuring cup. This stock is still warm. If I had made my stock beforehand, if I had made my stock beforehand, I would have heated it up. I would have um, heated it up. So the reason I was, I, with sauteing the rice is we also like there to be, and it was interesting because I didn't know that this had a name. When you make paella, there's like a name for the bottom, like that crunchy part of the paella. 
We call it pegado, which means stuck. Um, and there's a little bit of crispiness um, on the bottom. I think I might have shared, I'm not sure if I'd shared this story when I cooked with the library last time. I make this dish all the time. I love it. And I had made a bunch, um, as I said, a few weeks ago. And I thought that I had turned off the flame. It was done cooking. And I moved it back because I like to let the rice settle. Uh, like everything sort of come together off the heat. And inadvertently, I left it on one roll. It was, sal it was totally salvageable, but what I ended up having, which was so much fun for me, is I had the most perfect pegado on the bottom of the pan. I mean, I couldn't, if I was teaching somebody how to do pegado, I could not have replicated it. It was just an inadvertent, totally innocent mistake. I totally messed it up, but out of it, I had a very yummy, over-the-top meal of pegado and chicken. So, as you can see, what I did was I added back um, I added back the broth, the, I added the chicken stock, the tomato sauce, and now what I'm doing is I'm adding in my chicken. What I like about this dish, this dish is like, if you want to feed a crowd, this is the way to go. Um, my children went to Fisk, and a big tradition at Fisk, I think it still is, was the international potluck dinner. Um, every year, and I think I used to make this for like 50 people, and people would be like, where's the arroz con pollo? So there you go. And as you can see from the, from letting the chicken sit, there were still some pieces that were left, so I'm putting that in. I initially put the flame up to high so I could bring it to a boil. I am now going to completely reduce that heat. I'm going to take it down to low, and I am going to cover the pan. That one's not the right size. There we go. So that is now down, and we are ready to go with that. My oil is still heating here. I, you can sort of see, I'm going to bring you over here so you can see. There's a little bit of swirling action, like you can sort of see the movement. I'm not sure if the camera is high definition enough. Oh, there you can sort of see it. If you look here, if I if the top is 12 noon, if you kind of look in that area, you can see a little bit of movement in the oil. You, of course, could also use a candy thermometer or a digital thermometer, which, you know, maybe just for fun, I'm going to do that to see where we're at. So I can show you how to do that. Again, I think a lot of people are scared to use, to do a recipe that says, oh, deep fry, temperature this. This is a digital thermometer. I think I got this one at the supermarket. Super easy to use, very accurate. It's good up to 572 degrees, which I'm not gonna, I will never fry anything at that temperature. Um, actually, I'm kind of glad that I did it because it's showing me I still have a little ways to go here. Ooh. All right, so while that's heating up a little bit, um, we're going to move on over. Um, Maury, let's seal up some of the Manchego ones. Do you want to go check the camera angle for me? Maury wants to. So this is what these look like. And you really do want to make sure that they're tightened. I'm going to, if you can see, I'm kind of going over it with my finger. The reason I'm doing that is because you don't want it. Sometimes they will split open, but you really want to avoid that when they're cooking because what ends up happening is that you then have beef um, sort of all over. Um, so, well, Rory, actually, you know what, Rory? I'm going to let you seal those other ones too. And I'm going to check the camera angle over here. Excuse me, folks. You can see the messy sink in the background. Can you check that quickly so I can get to So as I said, what I'm doing right now is I am making something called mantecaditos. These are our, our cookies. In my pan, I have, um, sorry, my bowl. I have a quarter, a quarter cup of butter, and I have a half um, 
a half a cup of shortening. As you can imagine, like some of our baking recipes, um, some of our baking recipes have a lot of shortening in them because access to butter wasn't always something that we had. And I think that you also sometimes see that in some of the recipes from down south. Um, you kind of make do with what you're able to use um, wherever you're from. Um, I frankly think that baking with shortening, there's some great chocolate chip cookie recipes that have shortening in them that have, they hold up their shape really nicely. There's a lot of people, um, myself included, um, I have one particular pie recipe that I like to use that has uh, shortening in it. it. Actually has shortening and vodka in it. The vodka adds a really nice, you use a little bit of vodka instead of water um, and it adds, it evaporates out and adds like a nice texture to the particular dough. So what I'm doing right now is I am creaming the butter in the shortening. I left the butter out for about, hmm, probably about half an hour. Um, it is really important, especially as summer is coming along when you're making some of those recipes that you do pay attention to how much time you're leaving the butter out. Not because it's unsafe for the butter, but it's more that um, butter can get too soft and it can have um, an adverse effect on the recipe that you're making. The other thing that I like about this recipe is that this recipe doesn't have, um, it doesn't have eggs in it. It has no eggs in it. It's just kind of a simple sort of shortbread like recipe. What I'm doing with the spatula is I'm trying to make sure that I'm incorporating the butter and the shortening. It sort of looks like that. Um, I'm now going to add the sugar. And in one of those, um, it took me until I, and actually I think until I was studying to be a chef, there are certain flavors that I, I knew what the taste was, but I didn't know what the origin was. Um, and there's a really, there's yummy, really delicious bakeries in Puerto Rico. They make really good cakes, great cookies. Um, there is a bit, there's quite a bit of a Spanish influence on some of the pastries that we, we eat. But there's a particular flavor to birthday cake in Puerto Rico. And it wasn't until I was older and I studied pastry that I figured out that the secret to that taste was, do you remember what it was? Almond extract. Right? It has a very, very subtle flavor. Um, and the other thing that they do, which is more in the European tradition, is that when they make the cake, they actually, and this is very common in Europe, the cakes are brushed with some sort of simple syrup or some sort of fruit in what it could be a liqueur. And a lot of the cakes in Puerto Rico also get that brushing and it tends to have that almonds. Um, I would say almond extract is a very subtle flavor. Okay, Rory disagrees. The almond extract. Rory, um, if we had scratch and sniff television, you could smell the almonds. Um, I'm using Penzi's and I'm so grateful that I finally, I had run out of a bunch of spices. Penzi was, Penzi's was closed, but we finally got, you know, they were back ordered, but we got our order. Um, this was two and a quarter cups of flour. I am going to share this recipe um, online. Um, this is like, it's, it's going to look like a thumbprint. If you are familiar with the sesame from, you know, there's sesame thumbprints, there's jam thumbprints. So it's a really nice, easy dough. Now, originally I had intended to use that guava jelly that I talked about that I had made a mess with um, when I made the turnovers a little while ago, um, but it seems to have been eaten by my family and I did not double check before I did my grocery list. I've never, I've never had any. Your sister is the one who. Oh, she uses Vasper. Well, she had been using the guava, that's why I didn't have any more. Oh. So this is coming together, you know, it, it looks like a short, more like a short bread. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this into little balls and then we will put a thumbprint inside each of them and we will bake them off. Um, can you, I need, can you 
You get those crimped up so you can get them in the oven? The oven? You put these in the oven. I do. You didn't know that, huh? So I'm just getting my hands in here and using my hands to bring it, bring it together. And once again, I'm going to use one of my favorite products, the ice cream scoop, because of the portions that it, it, it makes, enables me to have cookies that are of an equal size. So I'm going to make these a little bigger than normal. Um, you could use, um, you can use a smaller a smaller scoop, but I wanted for demo purposes, I was going to make them a little bit bigger. Um, and it, it's not uncommon in Puerto Rico, you could see these, um, instead of having the guava, they might be have like, in the center colored sugar. And those were some of my favorites. Um, and I used to make these all the time with my best friend growing up. And we used to make multicolored, multicolored sugar cookies. All right, how are you doing with the crimp in there? Good. We're almost done. All right. So I know I'm going to put six of these cookies on the tray. And I'm just using my thumb. And it's okay if they're not, you know, my dough is a little crumbly today. And everyone can hear you too. People coming in to get snacks for their work breaks. So as you can see, it's pretty rustic looking, but it makes up the flavor of it is really quite nice. And actually I'm realizing that you may not be able to see because of the angle of the camera. So basically I've made a little bit of an indent for me to be able to put in the guava cakes. So, Roy, can you come over here and turn the camera on? So basically I'm taking the guava and it's malleable. So I'm making a little ball of it and I'm putting it in the middle. All right, we're gonna start frying off some of our, and cooking off some of our. Cool. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and put these in bottom and they're going to bake for about 20 minutes and then Rory oh you know what yes ma'am we're going to actually do these together can I have four of those um yeah we have three is fine no oh that one's not finished okay I'm going to because you told me to stop I know we're just going to put all three of them. You can just finish cooking. All right, so we're going to consolidate and put these into the oven for 350 for about 20 minutes. Now, if you've noticed, I have not touched the rice and chicken. I have not lifted the lid off of it. We do not lift the lid off of the pot when we're cooking rice. It is I, my kids laugh, but I kind of get a little bit, they've learned to cook rice. You don't take the lid off because it releases the steam and you're not able to sort of continue the cooking. So the way we do our rice is two parts water, two parts rice. You can saute it in a little bit of olive oil, add your water, bring it to a high boil. The minute it comes to a high boil, cut the heat to low, put your lid on, cook for 20 minutes, and then turn up the heat and your rice will be ready to go. And that's with long grain rice. Now, I'm going to take my digital thermometer just because I 
was curious to see where we are in terms of the temperature here. This is getting a little bit more to where I need it to be. Oh, yes. All right, we're good to go again. And obviously, you need to remember when you're using the digital thermometer that it, you kind of have to move it around a little bit because there's not going to be a consistency. So what I'm going to do now is I am going to take my meat pies and these could be, you know, put in the refrigerator um, and chilled um, if you were having guests and you wanted to make them to order. Alternatively, you can also cook them beforehand. That's totally, totally fine. They do work at room temperature. All right, so I'm going to bring bring you over so you can see what we've got going on here. So as you can see, oh, one of them is puffing. We're going to get some puffing. And we're going to let these cook for about five minutes, about two or three minutes into it. I am going to flip them over. Um, you can use tongs to do that. You could use a slotted spoon. Um, a, sp a slotted spoon is a really good tool to be able to have to be able to to be able to um, do it to get the oil over it. So as you can tell, they're floating to the top. They're floating to the top. And I'm going to use that slotted spoon. flip it over. Now, Rory rightfully observed, the reason these are a little tight in the pan, which is okay, is that there are two sizes of these turnover shells. And I usually buy the small ones. And I inadvertently, um, I don't think that their, their supplies are as plentiful as they were. I inadvertently grab the ones that are the large ones. So if I were making the large ones, I probably would, if I was serving this as an appetizer, one of them would be sufficient. If it were the smaller size, people sometimes like to have two or three. If you're a member of my family, you think that it's totally acceptable to have five or six of them. Yes. Which is why my grandmother and grandfather, we used to make 300 of them at a time, and inevitably they would all be gone. So right now we have cooking our rice and chicken probably has about another 10 or 15, 10 minutes. We'll get, it'll be hopefully done perfectly by the time we do it. What you want to do is you want to make sure that you have a cookie sheet. You want to make sure that you have a cookie sheet ready with paper towel so that you can drain the, the meat pies off of it. So what we do is I, Take them out, I drain them, and you want to be careful. You do not want to serve these right out of the pan because the filling will be really hot and people might burn themselves um, in doing that. So um, a lot of people always ask me, there, a lot of people think that Puerto Rican food is spicy. Um, we do like a little bit of spice, but really in reality, I would describe Puerto Rican food as being well seasoned. You know, it's that combination of all of the different, um, all of the different vegetables that we use, the adobo, um, but there isn't a lot of uh, hot peppers are not really indigenous, although we do make something called a chinero, which is basically, um, we basically infuse oil with some hot peppers and people like to put that on their tostones or on their fish dishes or things like that. Um, when people think of Puerto Rican food, arroz con pollo obviously is a really popular dish. A lot of plantain-based food. So we make a dish called mofongo, which is also that plantain. And it's basically mashed with garlic and fried and molded. And it can either be served with a chicken broth or it is sometimes served stuffed with fish. Since we are an island, we have an abundant, we have abundant access to seafood. There's a lot of grouper, red snapper. Um, there's Caribbean lobster, which is spiny. It looks more like an African lobster. It doesn't really have, um, as you see me raising my hands, it doesn't have claws. 
um, but it's really, it's really quite lovely. So we really try to make the most of using the products that are local and available to the island to make, uh, to make that food. Does anybody have any questions? This would be a great time as things are sort of cooking up. If you we actually have a lot of questions in the chat if you want me to go through those first. Let's do it. Um, someone had asked uh, the dough rounds, um, the ones that you can buy in the freezer section. Yes. Um, and then uh, with the arroz con pollo, does it work with skinless thighs? These were skinless thighs. So I do use skinless thighs today, so it would totally work with that. So if you, you know, are partial to using a skinless thigh, that would totally work. The next question is, um, where do you buy your manchego cheese and what age is it? Um, this was a very run-of-the-mill manchego cheese. I bought it at Market Basket. What age was it? Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't one of the aged manchegos. If I were getting an aged manchego, I would be serving that on a cheese plate. I wouldn't be using the aged manchego to make, you know, to make a t the turnover. Um, I think the aged manchego is meant to be enjoyed with, you know, a jamón ibérico, which is the span like any of the Spanish hams, the cured hams, or, you know, a really nice pasta mm -hmm. rioja. Um, I would save the aged manchego for that. Um, can you define garlic water? Garlic water, yes, of course. So basically um, what we do is we take a bowl of water and we would crush garlic, like five or six cloves of garlic and put it right in, um, in the water. So basically I'm infusing the water with garlic. There are some families that when they make their tostones, they actually rub the toston, the plantain itself with the garlic. Like they would take the garlic, cut it in half, and then take it and rub it. But we sort of like the subtler taste of soaking it in the garlic water. And the thing is that water actually helps make the plantain with the stone a little bit crispier. Um, with the arroz con pollo, how much um, tomato sauce did you use? They thought it looked like eight ounces. It was it exactly that. It was an eight ounce can of tomato sauce. And the other thing too is that what's easy about those little Goya cans, they're exactly eight ounces. So I'm very big on when I'm cooking, trying to make for less, less clean, like less cleanup. So having it be in an eight, eight ounce can, I mean, I love my box tomatoes, my pommy tomatoes, I absolutely love them, but they don't come in an eight ounce container. It's a much bigger container. So I tend to just use the, use the Goya. Could you tomatoes. measure it out though? I, I could measure it out, and sometimes what I do is I take the pommy, my son would have things, but he just measure it out. He's totally right. Um, I'll, I'll fill up a mason jar with it, and then I can use what I, what I need, and then use it for different uses. Um, we have a few more questions, if you're, unless if you're, you have to get back to no, no, cooking. No, I, um, I've mastered the art of cooking and talking. <laughs> um, two people asked if, they, if these recipes will be um, in writing at all. So yes, they will. So the um, Mina already has the arroz con pollo recipe along with the pita recipe, and then I'll be sharing the mantecadito, the cookie recipe, along with the um, the recipe for the pastelillos de manchego and guayaba, which are so, the ones. Uh, Mina Mina has them. I believe she has all of your emails, so she will be sharing all of those with you. Mina is the head of programming for those who aren't aware. Yeah. Matt's <laughs> colleague. Um, back to the arroz con pollo. Do you heat the stock if it is not warm, or can you use it cold? Yes, you do. Um, temperatures are really important when you're cooking. Um, I think it's really important if you're adding stock, if you're braising. Like let's say you were using beef stock and you were adding it to a braise to do short ribs. Same thing with the chicken. I would warm it. You could warm it in the microwave if you want, if that's the easiest thing. And here's the other thing. I don't want having homemade stock to be an obstacle to people trying this dish. If you have a good box stock that you use, awesome. If you have, if you, if you have bulgum cube, like chicken, the chicken cubes, you can use those. It's all about whatever you have and people shouldn't feel like they have to do everything to the nth degree to make any of these recipes. Many of the home cooks in Puerto Rico would probably just use the Goya bouillon cubes if they were making this quickly. Because really, if you have all these things, this is a meal, 
Like if you use a boneless chicken thigh, if you can, you know, chop up, you know, even if it's coarsely your veg before you go, this is a meal that you could have ready in about 35, 40 minutes. So don't let like having like the perfect ingredient or like the highest level of doing something be an obstacle to making any recipe. Um, someone had asked, could you give the name of the spice again, the one that's in the jar with the red top? Um, I think Goya should make me a spokesperson. <laughs> I think I single-handedly have increased adobo sales in Massachusetts. So it's called adobo. Um, and this particular one has salt. It has um, oregano, black pepper. There's actually a little um, turmeric in it as well, which is actually really good, you know, for inflammation. Um, did uh, someone had asked? Uh, is they were, they thought it was interesting that you didn't prick the pastry? Is there any reason that you didn't do that? That I didn't prick the pastry. Hmm. Um, this one, you know, this isn't a puff cake. It's not a puff pastry. It's more like um, like a pate brise or pate sucre. So I mean, which they could be pricked as well. This is a, this dough is pretty relaxed. It's been in the refrigerator, so it's not going to necessarily, as I look at it, I'm looking at it to make sure it's not necessarily going to get, you know, that, that puff because it's not a laminated dough to get all that, that rise. And, and what I'm about in terms of a laminated dough, so when you make a um, puff pastry, like what you would use to make a croissant, that process is folding over the layers of dough with the butter. And the peat, and because you still want there to be pieces of butter in that lamination, when that butter melts away um, in the baking process, that's what creates sort of those pockets and the puffiness in some of that puff pastry. And the last question so far is Can the turnover shells be used to bake instead of frying? They most definitely can. Um, it is a raging debate. Um, my father is a purist and you know, we baked them and he sort of was like, that's not the way they're supposed to be done, but totally works. Um, and it's really sort of a matter of preference. If you have, um, I think you recently, um, a lot of people seem to have the air fryers right now. You definitely could try it. I probably would coat it in olive oil and then put it in the air fryer, but you could certainly bake these. It's really a matter of your personal taste. And if you decided that you like the white ones better than the ones that are colored with an auto, you can mix and match. And the other thing is there's so many different things that these shells can be used for. You can put, you know, you can stuff them with, with just cheese. Um, some people make like a, a fish filling that has like cod and potato. You could fill it with that. They're really quite a versatile product that you could use to do a variety of things with. So that was all the questions so far. It seems like people are very interested and very hungry as well. I know. I wish I could hand out samples, right? <laughs> I think my family. I think my family knows what they're having for lunch today. We're going to have a Puerto Rican style lunch. All right. I'm going to put a few more in, and then I am going to take a peek at our rice and chicken. Someone just asked, "Are the shells Goya?" brand? They are. So Goya's tagline in Spanish is, si es Goya, tiene que, ser, tiene que ser bueno, which means like if it's Goya, it has to be good, which I guess they're using in English now too, which always, like everyone has those commercials that they remember from their childhood, but that's kind of the joke with my Puerto Rican friends, like si es Goya, tiene que ser bueno. It's like the good housekeeping seal of approval in Puerto Rican cooking. Right. Um, and another one just came in. Um, what kind of vegetables would you use if you were to make a vegetable empanada? If I were to make, um, I would probably do something. Hmm. I'm trying to think. I might do something that's potato based, like potato or sweet potato based, which I know sounds a little bit strange because it's sort of a, like two starches. But I probably would do something with maybe like potatoes and capers and olive oil, um, which is interesting because in Turkish cuisine, like they make like and throughout the Middle East, it, that's kind of a similar feeling that they would use in a breath. Um, 
Interesting enough, you know what else I might do? I also might make like an egg an eggplant caponata. Um, and actually even, it probably could even work with a with ratatouille, but I would probably really make sure that you've drained the vegetables. You really need to make sure that you've salted your eggplant before you've cooked it. And you want those vegetables to become a little bit more like a paste than sort of really maintaining their texture, if that, if that makes sense. Um, I'm not sure if you're vegan, I, Obviously, binding it with a little bit of cheese would certainly help. Um, but I think that those are some combinations that might work. Now, I'm going to flip these over and I'm going to take a quick peek. So, as you can see from these that are right, that are cooked, the shell has a really nice, nice texture to it. Right there. Sorry about that. That beautiful texture. And then I wanted to take you over here to see um, the baking of the the turnover. So you see the turnover is still. It's going to be pretty pale. If you wanted it to have a little bit of color, you probably could make an egg wash. You know, using one egg and a tablespoon or two tablespoons of water with that egg and brush it to it. But I kind of like the whiteness to it. So now we're going to come and see the moment of truth and see what our arroz con pollo looks like. I, you know, it's been close to 20 minutes. I haven't lifted. Ah, that's looking good. So this probably needs about another five minutes, but what I want to do is I want to make sure that I taste the rice to see how um, the texture of the, the texture of the grain so, you know, what you want to do is you want to make sure, I'm grabbing my fork, you want to make sure that, you know, obviously that the rice is cooked through. Oh, I can tell it's cooked through, yeah. Nice. I'm liking the texture of the rice. There's still a little bit more liquid than I might want on the top. So I'm going to actually leave that for probably about another five minutes. And actually what's going to happen there, because I know that the rice is already cooked, the chicken is already cooked through, um, we're going to get a little bit of what I talked about, about that big aloe, the, the stickiness um, on the bottom. The bottom. And there you can see once more, we kind of have the, the that really nice orange color on the meat pie. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut one of these open so you can see what they look like in the middle. Um, I'm thinking that one of our one of our cheese pies looks close to be ready to be done. So now you've seen. There we go. All right. So as you can see, that was pretty quick. I cooked off. Um, I cooked about three or four at a time. If you are using the big shells, which I didn't realize until I sort of started working today, I might have used a bigger pan for the frying. You could have used um, a pot, um, sort of your bigger, like the next size up from that, which people sometimes use as a stock pot or their big pot to make spaghetti. Okay. Can folks see me? My, is that okay? Uh, there you go. So you can see the, these were the first ones that I cooked. Um, and as you can see, the steam is still coming out of them. So that's why you really want to make sure that you let them sit. I would even let them sit a good 10, 15 minutes before you were to serve them to your guests and you would be fine. I'm going to go ahead and try that. That's my breakfast today. And it's making me very happy and it's not uncommon to see people have these for breakfast with a cup of coffee. Mm. Now let's go over to the oven. So my cookies are looking a little messy today. I think, oh, those feel good. The cookies are looking a little bit messy today. I would have wished that I, Wish that they were a little bit rounder, but you kind of get the idea. It's a traditional shortbread that you can make with a variety of things. 
what I'm going to do is I am going to bring this over here and I'm going to, we're going to try one of the, so it's really um, with these, you can see it has a nice beautiful texture. I'm just going to put it right on the cutting board that have the guava paste on it. Uh, that's nice. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to cut right through it. Um, and I'm going to that it actually it held its form pretty nicely. So the guava paste, you can see it right in the middle really held um, held its form. So I think that what Rory and I explained is that recently we had I had tried it with jelly. And what ended up happening is that the jelly completely ran out of the ran out of the pastry. So an alternative to doing that is if you wanted to use the jelly, what I would do is I would grate the manchego cheese and then mix it with the guava jelly. Um, I would probably do like start with like a half a cup of um, shredded manchego and a half a cup of jelly, but you probably will end up wanting to use more cheese than jelly. And I basically made a paste that I was able to scoop again with my ice cream scoop and fill it that way. And that was another way that you could have done it. But that's, so let me go ahead. It might be a little hot, but let's go ahead and try. Hot, but yummy. So those are all the things that I was gonna to demonstrate today. So if people have any additional questions, I'm more than happy to answer those or talk a little bit about what we're going to be doing in the knife skills class in a few weeks, if people have questions about that. There was um, two more things that came in chat. Someone said that they're Turkish and that they use cheese and parsley mixture or spinach with onions and cheese or potato fillings as their veggie options and that they saute them first before putting them in. Perfect. Those are, they're delicious. And the second one um, is is the garlic added in the plantain or dipped in garlic water before frying and what temperature are the empanadas baked at? Okay, so um, in terms of the garlic, I would not fry the garlic with the tostones, all right? When we make the dish called mofongo, there is some, there is like sort of garlic mixed through there, but the texture of the mofongo, there's so much of the plantain that it prevents the, um, it prevents the the garlic from burning. If you were to add the garlic with the tostone because it's frying at about 350, 365 degrees, the, the garlic's gonna burn and it's gonna taste horrible. So what you wanna do is you wanna leave that garlic in the water and you wanna leave it there and take the tostone out and fry it. So the other thing too is, again, I'm going back to Goya, they actually make a frozen tostone that is delicious. All you need to do is, is fry it. Um, and then what we do is we make it some, some different dipping sauces. We, there's a really fancy dipping sauce. It's basically like mayonnaise, ketchup, and grated garlic. We call it mayu ketchup and really original, but actually it's a really good sauce. Like that garlic hint with the, the mayo or an aioli, fantastic with, um, with the tostón. Does anyone have any more questions? You can unmute yourself or use the chat function. Hi. Can I ask a question? Uh, what temperature do you bake the uh, empanada? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, you had asked that question. At 350 degrees. I baked it at 350 degrees. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, if, if that's it, um, this was recorded and will be on, um, oh, somebody just asked, uh, what temperature is the oil heated to again? Um, the oil was heated to 350 degrees. Okay. And, um, and, and if you don't have a thermometer, that's totally fine. The best way to get oil to 350 degrees is to, you know, to have it at about, you know, to heat it on medium heat. And if as you're cooking, you're noticing that the cooking time, like the, the color of your meat pie or whatever you're frying, is if it's taking on color too quickly, then you want to play with it. If you have a gas stove, you want to lower that flame. If you even if you have an electric induction, you want to lower that flame a little. So you want to sort of be 
paying attention to the fact that realizing that yes, the oil will get hotter as you go along. But the other thing to remember is that every time you put in a new batch of things to fry, the oil temperature is going to drop. Okay, so you do want to make sure that you're watching and paying attention to see what it looks like. Well, thank you so much, Trisha. Um, um, it. it was absolutely my pleasure. I hope that people really enjoyed um, if this was sort of your first experience with Puerto Rican cooking. I hope that you were inspired to go and try some of it. If you're looking for some great, um, I want to show you one thing since it is for the library. I had meant to go on the, I meant to go on the, did online and see if this book was in the library's collection. So if you're looking for a great Puerto Rican cookbook, Willow Bennett, who I spoke about before, has a fantastic cookbook. Um, sort of the Julia Child of Puerto Rican cooking. Her name is Carmen Alboy Valdejuli. Um, it, it, the book is known as Cocina Criolla in Spanish or Puerto Rican cookery. But this was um, a present that was given to me by my family when I was young. It's a very traditional um, gift that people give to each other as people are learning how to cook. But she is a wonderful, wonderful teacher. And she likes to explain what to look for, what you should look for in a recipe, like what it should look like as you're doing it. But this is a fantastic, um, another fantastic um, one. There's also another one called Daisy Cocina. I can also, I'll, I'll give these to Mina. But if you're looking for some Puerto Rican inspiration, these are some great examples of um, great Puerto Rican cookbooks. Thank you. And I'll, I'll see if we have those. Um, and Mina will let everyone know. You can also use bookshop.org, um, which will show you uh, places that you can order books if you're looking to avoid Amazon. Um, but thank you again, uh, Trisha. And this will be on the library's YouTube page later today, hopefully, if not tomorrow. Um, so you can watch it at your leisure anytime. And Mina will be sending out those recipes to everyone who attended. So thank you. Wonderful. Hopefully some of you will be able to join us in a few weeks for Knife Skills. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy the weather, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.